here in Atmospheric Oceanic Sciences, and thanks for joining us remotely today, as uh, we have the pleasure of getting to hear from uh, Dr. Ruby Leung, who is from the Department of Energy in the Pacific Northwest National Labs. Um, I, when I had a chat with Ruby earlier today, and we were talking about how she is a, both a modeler and has recently led a field experiment thinking broadly about extremes, uh, extreme weather systems and their role in the climate, uh, whether that's mesoscale systems we'll hear about today, but also about atmospheric rivers on which she led a field campaign recently, um, as well as in tropical cyclones. And while she is also somebody who studies extremes, she is also somebody who has done an extremely much for the science, uh, including having a, uh, in a stellar track record of um, mentoring scientists and working on a number of problems in climate scientists, uh, having published over 350 papers, um, which is just amazing. Uh, her work spans uh, a variety of fields, as I mentioned. Uh, she is the chief scientist of the Department of Energy's Energy Exascale Earth System Model, or E3SM, as some of you know. Um, and is also a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the AMS, a fellow of the AAAS, and a fellow of the AGU. Uh, she had received the AGU Burt Bolin Award in 2019 and the Atmospheric Science Birkness Lecture in 2020, and I believe the AMS Hydrology Medal as well. And she has also recently been awarded the Battelle Fellow, uh, which provides significant source of research funding and, and distinguish um, uh, recognition at the Department of Energy. Um, today, we're going to be hearing a little bit about some one piece of her work focused on observations and modeling of mesoscale convective systems. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. And thank you very much. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much for the nice introduction. It's my honor to be here, um, although only virtually uh, meeting with you all. And I had a great um I had many great meetings this morning with some students and faculty members. So with that, I'm going to start sharing screen and hopefully it works. Okay, so let me know if uh, you can see my screen. Okay, I'm going to start. Yeah, you, yeah mm -hmm. start the... I'm going to do the slideshow mode. Okay, so... Perfect. All right, great. So. Yeah, uh, today I'm going to talk about mesoscale convective systems in observations and a, a hierarchy of model. Uh, but before I, I talk about MCSs or mesoscale convective systems, I first of all like to really mention that um, a lot of uh, the, the work that I am presenting um, is really based on team efforts. I really want to acknowledge many of my colleagues that we work together. Um, all the most of the work that I am presenting today is from a particular uh, DOE um, sponsored project is called Water Cycle and Climate Extremes Modeling. Uh, but some of the work also comes from E3SM as well as from another project called Exascale Computing Project where we do cloud resolving climate model of the earth system. So I would have to say that uh, a lot of the motivation for studying mesoscale convective systems come from uh, our desire to better understand how extreme events or extreme precipitation might be changing in the future. There are lots of evidences of extreme events already been increasing in the past. So this is a UN report uh, in 2020 showing comparison of uh, two time period an earlier period from 1980 to 1999 to a more recent period from 2000 to 2019. So they are showing the number of uh, disaster events by different types. So as you can see, um, there are lots of increases in disaster, uh, especially natural disaster related to climate, such as drought, um, extreme temperature, floods, storms, and even wildfires. So these have all been increasing in the past um, few decades. And as a result, there are always also associated increases in impacts on human beings, such as uh, deaths um, or, or economics. So um, an important question we always ask is why extreme weather events might be 
expected to increase with global warming. So I would like to really particularly talk about this paper that we just published about two weeks ago um, in PNAS, where we emphasize, even though we always talk about global warming as temperature, but what is really most important in terms of extreme weather event is really humidity, right? So humidity increases with temperature at a nonlinear rate. So this is what we all know, the clausius clapeyron relationship, that the moisture will increase nonlinearly with temperature. So what are the um, implications of such nonlinear increase of humidity with temperature? I think there are quite a few things that we need to pay attention to. So because water vapor itself is a greenhouse gas, so as the humidity um, increase in the humidity can amplify warming itself by a factor of 1.5 to 2. So it's really important to consider humidity. But besides that, humidity also important because as humidity increases with global warming, so does the latent heat release by uh, these water vapor when they condense. And this is the main drivers of tropical convection and atmospheric circulation. And as a result, the increase in the latent energy also play a major role in the increase in weather extremes. So this paper, we really emphasize that even though we always talk about global warming using surface air temperature as a metric for global warming, we advocate that it is important for us to think about global warming, not just in terms of surface air temperature, but also in terms of surface equivalent potential temperature, we call it theta E at the surface. This is an important parameter because it's an integrated metric of temperature and humidity. And therefore, it's a more comprehensive metric of global warming. And as we will show, in fact, this quantity is much more highly correlated with weather extremes than surface air temperature, which is why we're advocating the use of surface equivalent potential temperature as a measure of global warming and its impacts. So here, we'd like to show you just some examples that we show in that paper. Um, if, if you look at convective available potential energy, CAPE, which is a really important parameter when we look at convection, which produce a lot of extreme precipitation around the world. Um, if you look, do a correlation between the surface air temperature with CAPE, you see that um, there are lots of area with positive correlation, but particularly overland, in fact, is a negative correlation. On the other hand, if you do a correlation between theta E at the surface with CAPE, you actually see mostly a positive correlation almost everywhere around the world, suggesting that tropical convection or convection in general, um, using theta E is a much better measure um, of CAPE or convection. Similarly, if we look at annual maximum precipitation, this is uh, for area between 30 degrees south and 30 degrees north. And we find that uh, correlating the annual maximum precipitation with surface air temperature, you only get a correlation coefficient of 0.33. Whereas if you are doing this against uh, the theta E at the surface, you get a really strong correlation of 0.98, again, suggesting that extreme events correlate much better with theta E than surface air temperature. And it's also very important to notice that if you plot the uh, surface temperature trend, let's say in the past few decades, mostly you see what we call polar amplification with higher temperature or higher warming in the higher latitude. But if you plot the trend in the th uh, uh, in theta E, uh, the equivalent potential temperature at the surface, you actually see a much more uniform warming everywhere uh, around the world. And looking at the projection into the future, often we think about surface air temperature projection into the future increases almost like linearly. But if you are looking at the theta E and the projection of how it might change in the future, you see a much more significant nonlinear increase in the theta E in the future because it incorporates the information of humidity, which increases with air temperature based on the clausius clapeyron relationship. So in this paper, we quantified that by the end of the century, by the end of this century, 
if you look at surface air temperature alone, roughly you might see a three to four degrees Celsius of warming in the future by the end of the century. But if you are looking at theta Yi, you would be seeing an increase of almost like 12 degrees, suggesting that the warming itself is actually very significant. So what are the implications of this 12 degree increase in the theta Yi? What we find is that a 12 degree increase in the theta Yi contributes to 14 to 30 fold increase in the frequency of heat extremes, a 40% increase in the energy available tro for tropical deep convection, and then up to a 60% increase in the extreme precipitation. So we really advocate that this is, this is an important parameter for us to look at. The much faster rate of increase in weather extremes than the quasi-linear surface air temperature rate is because of this um, increase in the theta Yi. So um, in, the, in the recent IPCC, there has been a lot of discussion about like limiting global warming to let's say 1.5 degrees Celsius or limiting global warming to two degrees Celsius. If global warming con continue to increase at a much, at a almost like quasi-linear rate, it would be really difficult to uh, determine like, so uh, at what degree should we limit global warming to? But if we are using theta Yi to consider at what degree we should be limiting global warming to, you would have a much better justification because after a certain uh, temperature, this increase is so nonlinear that it would have major impact on extreme events. So we advocate for the setting of warming targets based on theta Yi at the surface instead of just surface air temperature. If our goal is to limit changes in the weather extremes, which has important policy implication. So with that, I'm go now going to kind of like motivating more specifically uh, the need to look at mesoscale convective systems. So if we look at theta Yi at the surface projecting into the future um, with more and more warming, if you look at surface air temperature alone, you would mostly be seeing a polar amplification. But with theta Yi, actually, you will see an amplification over the tropics because that's the area where the humidity increases really fast. And with a nonlinear relationship, it really amplifies the changes in the theta Yi. Although generally, if you look at this pattern, the change in the theta Yi is still pretty uniform spatially. But we know that projecting the future in terms of daily precipitation, uh, precipitation let's say some parameter of extreme precipitation, there are large spatial variations because these changes are also influenced not only by humidity, but also by changes in the atmospheric circulation. Now going to the North America in particular, um, in the previous reports, they look at changes in summertime precipitation. And we see a very um, highly uncertain uh, change projecting into the future in terms of summer precipitation is mainly focusing over the central United States. So this caused me to wonder, I mean, since we know that a lot of the precipitation in the central United States comes from mesoscale convective systems, could the uncertainty in projecting future changes in precipitation over the central United States be related to the problems that we are having in climate models in simulating mesoscale convective systems? So this is really part of the motivation for us looking into MCSs. So we know that MCSs produce about 30 to 70 percent of the warm season rainfall and over half of the extreme daily rainfall in, this, in the US Great Plains are contributed by MCSs during summertime. So just to make sure we are all on the same page in terms of what a mesoscale convective system is. So here is a schematic showing a mesoscale convective system. Um, this is a contiguous cumulolimbus cloud complex, and they are really big with a horizontal dimension, usually of hundreds to thousands of kilometers, and they can last up to 10 to 24 hours. So, and so, so with a very large enfold area and deep convective cores, 
mesoscale scale circulation is generated, and this, this mesoscale scale circulation is actually important in really organizing such a big cumulonimbus cloud complex. So this is in contrast to typical deep convective clouds or cumulus clouds that we normally look at. And these type of clouds usually only last for a few hours, and they usually only have a horizontal dimension of less than 10 kilometers compared to like hundreds to thousands of kilometers. So this, there are three science questions that we have been asking. So the first one is how well are MCSs simulated by using different modeling approaches? And the second question, what limits and contributes to predictability of MCSs during summertime? And here we are focusing mostly over the central United States. And then lastly, we also ask how may MCSs respond to global warming and contribute to changes in mean and extreme precipitation in the central US and other regions that are frequently visited by MCSs? So here, I'm going to start with the first question. How well are MCSs simulated using different modeling approaches. In order to answer this question, I have to emphasize that um, there have been lots of previous studies looking at precipitation in climate model, and they see dry biases in the central United States, and they would normally attribute the dry biases to the inability of climate models to simulate mesoscale convective systems, because we know that in the central United States, a lot of the M precipitation is really coming from MCSs. But in reality, none of those uh, studies actually determine explicitly whether those precipitation produced by climate models are MCSs or not MCSs, right? So in order to really quantify the ability of climate models or weather model as well, in terms of whether they are able to simulate MCSs, we put in quite a bit of effort in developing methods that we can use to track MCSs in both observations and model simulations. So here we show the method, the general ideas of the method that we use. As I mentioned before, um, MCSs are characterized by very large upper level um, enfolds, and therefore they would be associated with cold cloud shield. If you look down from the satellite, you can see a large area of very cold cloud with um, very different brightness temperature because of how high uh, the, the long wave radiation is being emitted at the top. So based on these um, cold cloud shield, as well as the precipitation produced by the MCSs, usually with local area related to the convective core that produce very heavy precipitation, but also very large area of precipitation produced by stratiform area as well. So based on these two features, we can track MCSs and reproduce a MCS database hourly data set at four kilometer resolution over the US based on satellite cloud top infrared radiation to look at the cold cloud shield. And then based on the next red radar refractivity to tell us how intense the convection is. And then also based on the stage four precipitation data set. So this data set cover the period of 24 to 2017. But more recently, we extended this type of data set to global data set by applying very similar type of tracking of the cold cloud shield or cold cloud systems together with the precipitation produced by the system. The, uh, applying that to satellite data of cloud top infrared radiation, as well as to the GPM iMERGE precipitation data. So based on these two data set we, and the algorithm that we use to track MCSs, now we have a global MCS data set that covers the area of 60 degrees south to 60 degrees north for a time period from 2000 to 2019. So then we have these tracks of the MCS at 10 kilometer resolution and hourly resolution. With these kind of tracks, then we can create a lot of statistics of MCS about where they happen, um, how long the lifetime of these MCSs are, what's the size of the MCSs, the propagation speed, the rainfall amount produced by MCSs, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just an example of a paper that we published about the global MCS data set where based on all the MCS tracks that we identify, 
then we can calculate the MCS number and we see over the tropical area, MCSs happen very often um, in, in, in the tropical region compared to the mid-latitude region. We can also uh, calculate uh, the fraction of precipitation, the total precipitation that is contributed that by MCSs. Again, you see tropical area, especially for example, over the Sahel region and, and over the um, Argentina, that kind of area where a large fraction of precipitation is produced by MCSs. And we also produce other information such as the lifetime of MCSs. They can last pretty long, sometimes up to 24 hours. And also the MCS translation speed. If the environment, uh, the um, wind, environmental wind is an important factor of MCS translation speed, you can definitely see this evidence in terms of higher MCS translation speed at the higher latitude where the uh, background prevailing winds are much stronger than over the tropical area. So now that we have these methods to track MCSs in observation data and also in model simulation, then we have applied that to some particular simulations. These are climate simulations produced in this model intercomparison called high-risk MIP. So in the high-risk MIP, uh, climate models were applied at roughly between 25 to 50 kilometer resolution, a bit higher than the typical climate models are usually applied at about 100 kilometer resolution. So tracking MCSs in model simulation and observation, we find that it also depends on how you are tracking MCSs. Very typically, uh, some studies track MCSs only based on the large cold cloud shield without looking at the precipitation amount. We find that if you only track MCSs that way and don't care about the precipitation amount, then you might come to very different conclusion in terms of whether the model is able to simulate all the MCSs, uh, overproduced over MCSs or underproduced MCS compared to observation. So in any case, we can also composite the precipitation associated with MCS and then ask how well climate models are able to simulate these kind of precipitation feature. And we find that there are varying skills uh, across different models in the high-risk MIP. Um, so this is um, generally, uh, we find that uh, models have deficiency in simulating MCSs, especially in the summertime over the uh, central United States. Um, partly this is um, because of the fact that in climate models, because the resolution is pretty coarse, and we have to use parameterizations to represent convection. And a basic assumption in convection parameterization is that you have cloud population or population of convection that is in quasi equilibrium with the environment. But with an MCS, you actually get a, a single organized MCS sometimes can be even bigger than the size of a climate model grid cell. And therefore, this um, idea about a population of convection in quasi equilibrium with the environment may not actually apply. And therefore, potentially, a lot of the convective parameterizations that you, we are using in climate models may not actually work well. And therefore, we have recently started looking at climate models that can go to much higher resolution. For example, with a regional model, you can go to a specific region and go to very high resolution, such as like the weather research and forecasting model. And now there are also climate models, atmospheric model where you have the ability to use unstructured grid and only do high resolution over a particular region and then low resolution elsewhere. Additionally, we also have this super parameterization where we embed a cloud resolving model within a climate model grid cell so that we can better resolve deep convection by the cloud resolving model. So I'm going to show you just some results to give you a flavor of how well these type of modeling approaches might be able to simulate MCSs. So the first example is using the weather research and forecasting model. So we perform simulation for a summer uh, and and then we uh, use the MCS tracking method and track all the MCSs in observation and the model simulation, compare statistics of, let's say, uh, probability density distribution, uh, distribution of the MCS lifetime 
Uh, the MCS mean precipitation by MCS event and also the size of MCSs. And we see that actually when we go down to four kilometer resolution in this case, where we turn off the deep convection scheme, the model is able to simulate these various statistics of MCSs quite well. We also look at this particular modeling approach where we also get down to four kilometer, but in a global framework where the four kilometer is only applied to a specific region, such as the central United States. And here I'm showing you simulations over April versus simulation over August. In both April and August, uh, there are lots of MCSs generated uh, over the central United States. So here we compare observation in a Hofmuller diagram and then three simulations at three different resolution in the inner part where we have high resolution. We see that in, in spring, uh, like April, uh, the model is able to capture these uh, convective precipitation associated with MCSs quite well, even at lower resolution. However, when we get down to summertime, like August, um, four kilometer is still doing okay. It was able to simulate some of the MCSs, but definitely at low resolution, the simulation becomes very poor. So there is a big contrast in terms of model skill comparing springtime versus summertime. So this leads us to ask the question, like why the model is behaving this way. But before I talk about that, I'm, model, I'm showing another approach where we use the super parameterization. Right? So we embed a cloud resolving model within each GCM grid cell, and then we see whether the model can now simulate MCSs. Again, we contrast springtime versus summertime. And so left-hand side is the um, ob observation of MCS precipitation. The middle panel is simulation with super parameterization. And then the right hand panel is without the super parameterization. We, we see obvious improvement in simulation where we embed a cloud resolving model within a GCM grid cell. So the model is able to produce much more MCS precipitation compared to without the use of the super parameterization. But then again, a big contrast, springtime versus summertime emerge. You see that the model actually reproduced the observation quite well in the springtime, but in, in the summertime, even with a cloud resolving model embedded in inside each GCM grid cell, the model still significantly under predict MCSs and MCSs precipitation. So in order to uh, uh, understand why I'm gonna, uh, okay. so uh, let's take a look at also global simulations of um, MCSs. So we are now also have the capability to, to do this kind of uh, three kilometer or cloud resolving simulation globally, particularly with the energy exascale earth system model where we have a version that um, with a non-hydrostatic dynamical core. Uh, so I'm just going to show you a movie showing that, um, uh, showing the simulation where we track all the MCSs within the simulation. The upper panel is based on model simulation and then the lower panel is based on tracking MCSs in the GPM data set. The white blobs, uh, these are the, are the cold cloud shield associated with the MCSs. So you can see when we get down to higher resolution, model scale definitely improve, but there is still a difference between model scale between springtime versus summertime. Um, so then uh, this leads us to ask the question like why that is the case, and this is actually the second question related to what limits and contribute to predictability of MCSs during summertime, right, because summertimes appear to be the most challenging for models uh, to do. So um, the first point I want to make is that um, MCSS has a very large cold cloud shield uh, with stratiform rain produced by the MCS system. And as a result, you would typically see a very top heavy heating profile associated with MCSS. And as a result of the top heavy heating profile, uh, you, can, you can calculate the potential vorticity and you can actually determine that such top heavy heating profile can produce a mesoscale vortex based on these um, 
uh, potential vorticity. And so the mesoscale vortex can provide a lifting mechanism and a positive feedback that can help the MCS to continue to strengthen and produce more precipitation. So we think that this positive mechan feedback mechanism might be one reason for models not being able to simulate MCSs very well, because for example, if your model is not able to simulate this top heavy heating profile, then you would not be able to simulate the mesoscale vortex. And as a result, you would not be providing a positive feedback and enhance the simulation of MCSs. To test whether this is indeed the case, we perform two simulations using the Wolf model just by varying the cloud microphysics scheme. We know that cloud microphysics has a pretty big effect on the ability of the model to simulate mesoscale convective systems. And indeed, we find that using two particular cloud microphysics scheme, they produce um, somewhat different top heavy heating profile with the Thompson scheme producing a stronger top heavy heating profile compared to the use of the Morrison cloud microphysics scheme. And therefore, with this stronger vertical gradient of the diabetic heating, you would expect a stronger potential vorticity or mesoscale vortex. And indeed, this is what we found in the simulation. And based on what we said about the positive feedback, indeed, what we found is that the simulation using the Thompson scheme with heavier top heating profile and stronger uh, potential vorticity and mesoscale vortex, this particular simulation produced more MCS of longer lasting lifetime. So suggesting that indeed this might be an important mechanism for the model uh, to be able to replicate. Another um, thing that we can take a look at in terms of like why summertime is so much harder than the, uh, the springtime to simulate the MCS is, is that uh, here we are looking at the environmental condition associated with an MCS. And we find that very typically during springtime, an MCS develop under very strong synoptic scale forcing, such as a cold front. Whereas in the summertime, MCSs tend to pro be produced under a high pressure system, which you, you might think is actually unfavorable for any convection to happen. But on the other hand, on the periphery of the high pressure system, in fact, MCSs can develop. So we take a look further into the contrasting large scale environment associated with MCS during springtime versus summertime. So here we uh, composited the large scale environment for MCSs based on these tracking data set that we develop and then combining that with reanalysis data. And then using self-organizing maps uh, or SOM, we identify four types of large scale environments that support MCSs during summertime. So the two or three different types of, uh, the two types of environment over here, featuring in the upper level, this kind of, um, dipole kind of like high and low pressure system over here is favorable for convection because you have these um, uh, vorticity ahead of the low uh, pressure over here that would be conducive to vertical motion. So these are the favorable type of environment that can support mesoscale convective systems. On the other hand, we find that very often MCSs can also happen in a large scale environment, which is totally unfavorable for convection, as I show in the previous movie, right? So if you have a if you have a low pressure over this region, in fact, this would not be inducing vertical motion it, um, that would be conducive to convection. On the other hand, if we do a composite of the environment by following the center of the convection. We see that even though the large scale environment itself is not favorable for convection, but the local environment is still quite favorable in that you would actually see a positive surface equivalent potential temperature anomaly that is producing moisture important for convection. So looking at this a little bit more, we continue to use this convection centered composite to look at the large scale environment. And this time we are looking particularly at the uh, potential vorticity, uh, looking at 
the initiation of MCSs that happen at hour zero, and then 36 hours before MCS is initiated, and then 36 hours after MCS is initiated. We find that in the four types of environment that I just talked about, they all we, we see this kind of propagating, eastward propagating feature associated with all of them. Uh, suggesting this propagating environment is very important for MCS uh, initiation. And you can also see interestingly that um, not only the environment before an MCS uh, initiation at hour zero, you see this propagating potential vorticity, but after the MCS is generated or initiated at hour zero, you also see another line of potential vorticity, but this is the potential vorticity generated by the MCSs themselves. And so you can actually see the difference between PV generated by the MCS versus the PV from the environment itself. So regardless, we see that uh, it is important for the model to be able to capture this kind of yeastward propagating environment. Some yeastward propagating environments are of large scale features, but some of these eastward propagating environments are very small scale or meso scale. They might be related to mid tropospheric perturbation that could be originating from the Rocky Mountain, like Lisi vorticity generation. They could be residual short wave trough or gravity wave uh, initiated by the mountain. So whether the model has enough resolution and the capability to simulate this kind of smaller scale eastward propagating environment could be an important factor in whether the model can simulate summertime MCSs. And then another factor that we like to consider is whether the surface, the land surface also might play a role in terms of whether a model is able to simulate MCSs or not. So for that, we develop a technique in climate model where we use a water tracer. So we, because we have developed a data set to identify at each hour, and at each location, whether the precipitation is associated with MCS or not, then we can put a water tracer, like a numerical tagging to tag the precipitation associated with MCS separately from precipitation associated with non-MCS. And we follow these precipitation when they reach the land surface to see how much of it comes back through evaporation and how much of it goes down and to become surface runoff and how much is stored in the soil moisture. So this uh, water tracer packing technique is very important for us to really see what happened to MCS versus non-MCS precipitation after they reach the surface and the phase, how much of it comes back as evapotranspiration. So with this type of technique, we find that there are important differences in how MCS precipitation affect surface fluxes compared to non-MCS precipitation. First of all, MCS precipitation, the intensity is usually much stronger. And therefore, when this type of precipitation reaches the surface, it can percolate much faster and then get down to the lower part of the land surface. And therefore you would see more of the precipitation reaching soil moisture in below uh, at a deeper layer. And then it can be stored within the, the subsurface soil moisture and store that for a longer period of time. So there is a big difference between the soil moisture profile related to MCS precipitation versus non-MCS precipitation. Another important factor is that MCS precipitation is much larger in terms of the spatial scale. You recall in the beginning, I said that MCSs, their spatial scale may be hundreds to thousands of kilometers, whereas non-MCS precipitation might be very small, like of the order of like 10, tens of kilometer. So the difference in the size also make a big difference. So in a recent paper that we just published last year um, in PNAS, we combine the precipitation data set that tells us whether the precipitation is MCS versus non-MCS, combining that with the land surface model simulation where we tag 
the phase of the MCS and non-MCS precipitation, how much goes back to evapotranspiration. Then we can calculate the soil moisture precipitation coupling strength associated with MCS rain versus non-MCS rain. And we find that the soil moisture precipitation coupling strength is much stronger for MCS rain compared to non-MCS rain over the central United States, partly because of how much the precipitation of MCS can percolate to the deeper soil and be stored in the, in the form of soil moisture and supplying evapotranspiration later in the summer. So without going to too much detail into this study, I just want to highlight the important uh, conclusion coming from this study. So basically what we found is that MCSs really dominate the soil moisture precipitation feedback for summertime rainfall in the central United States. And it does that by two different mechanisms. Number one, MCSs precipitation have much larger footprint on the, on the ground, and therefore it can create very organized or cohesive soil moisture anomalies which can then induce secondary circulation. So for example, you can have a soil moisture anomaly wetter over here and wetter over here and drier in between. This organized structure of the soil moisture anomaly can induce secondary circulation that can then enhance convection over the dry area. At the same time, mesoscale convective system produce precipitation that percolates much deeper into the soil and provide a, a continuous and gradual so a source of evapotranspiration that really fits into the atmosphere and provide the moistening of the atmosphere to strengthen convection in the summertime. So um, again, this also suggests that potentially if model is not able to simulate well mesoscale convective systems to begin with, then it would also be affecting how soil moisture precipitation feedback may play a role and subsequently enhance convection in the summertime and therefore affecting the ability of the model to be able to simulate uh, MCSs in the summer. So with that, I come to my last question. How may MCSs respond to global warming and contribute to changes in precipitation? So with that, I first of all start by uh, a study that we published a few years ago, instead of modeling how MCSs may change in the future, we simply use the MCS data set that we already developed over the United States. And we ask, can we actually see any changes in MCS frequency or precipitation already happening in the past 35 years. So in this study, looking at just observation data, after we track the MCSs in the data set for the last 35 years, we find that MCS precipitation, especially the 95th percentile, the, the, the stronger um, amount of precipitation produced by MCSs, we have already been seeing an increasing trend over the last 30 years, increased by 4 to 10% per decade. And also we identified that from observation, there has been a lengthening of the MCS lifetime by about 4% per decade um, Lasting So MCSs in the last 35 years have already been lasting longer and producing more extreme precipitation. So to understand why that might have been the case, uh, so we look at the reanalysis data to see if we can identify any changes in the large scale environment that might support the fact that MCSs have already been changing. So what we see is that um, if you look at surface temperature, for example, uh, there is definitely uh, reanalysis data show that there has been larger warming over land compared to the ocean because the land surface has lower heat capacity. And so this contrast in the surface warming over land compared to the ocean can create an anomaly of uh, sea level pressure. And as a result, you can also see an enhancement of um, southerly flow bringing more moisture from the Gulf of Mexico to potentially feed the MCSs and therefore associated with longer lifetime as well as producing more precipitation. So this is what we have seen in the past, but in order to project 
what might change in the future. We have started looking, uh, developing a Lagrangian puzzle model to help us better identify what are the key mechanisms for the development of MCS and therefore how such mechanisms may be affected by global warming. So in this study that we published last year, we developed a simple Lagrangian puzzle model where we, it's just a single column model where we look at a, a puzzle of air uh, that uh, rises and is buoyancy driven from the surface rises up to the upper troposphere. So this model roughly is similar to the model developed by Roms and Huang, although we have made some particular changes, but I'm not going to go through the detail. For th those of you who are interested in this, please take a look at our paper published in Jazz uh, just last year. So with this um, simple puzzle model, we first of all ask what contribute to convection? to begin with, right? So, so this is showing the results from very simple simulation from the puzzle model, where we have two axes over here. The X axis, we increase the boundary layer moistening. So how, what's the anomaly of the boundary layer moisture? And then in the Y axis, we is a function of the dynamical lifting, like the lifting mechanism for the air parcel. So you can see pretty obviously that as you increase the boundary layer moistening, you would see the increase in the probability of the air parcel being lifted and produce convection. So what I'm showing here in terms of the color is the final height of the air parcel. So the higher the height means that the air parcel undergone deep convection, right? So moisten, boundary layer moistening is important, but at the same time, dynamical lifting is also important. The stronger the dynamical lifting, you can also allow the parcel to really convect. So both of these are important factor for summertime because surface moistening could come from soil moisture and the dynamical lifting mechanism could be coming from these eastward propagating features that I mentioned before that can induce vertical motion. Right. So based on this simple puzzle model, we first of all see how under global warming we might expect convection to change. So here I'm showing you just um, based on current precipitation simulated by the parcel model. So for, for each grid point over the United States, we drive the parcel model using reanalysis large scale condition. And then we compare the precipitation simulated by the parcel model with the observation showing roughly some correspondence with higher precipitation amount in the southeastern United States and then drying to the north. But also importantly, when we drive this simple parcel model with large scale environment simulated by climate model for the present day and for the future, and then compare the difference between the two, the parcel model shows that in the future with global warming, actually there would be a reduction of precipitation over the central United States. And interestingly, this, is simulated simply by a puzzle model is very comparable to global climate model in the CMIP simulations. They also show that the central United States, there would be drying. So the reasoning for this drying is simply because of the increasing land aridity under global warming, warmer temperature at the surface, but not enough moisture supply by the surface. And therefore there is an increase in the convective inhibition. And this is essentially causing a reduction in the convection and therefore a reduction in the precipitation projected for the future. So even though we got these results very comparable to CMIP-5 without actually running all these climate model simulations, we asked the question, but this is only based on a simple parcel model that is representing deep convection not necessarily mesoscale convective systems, right? So then we started thinking about how can we develop a simple model that can represent mesoscale convective systems? So now we started to connect the parcel model. Each parcel model is a simple single column, but we can connect them together to become a multi-column Lagrangian parcel model. And with this multi-column Lagrangian parcel model, we introduce several mechanisms that people have discussed are important for 
the development of MCSs, particularly the cool pool interaction mechanisms. So with this simple model, we introduced three simple uh, ideas into the model. The first one is we allow strong lifting effects due to the cold pool collision. So when conduction happen within a particular column, then precipitation is produced and there will be evaporative cooling and then we would generate a cold pool and then the cold pool will propagate and then when the cold pool collide, then it would generate a uplifting mechanism by the collision of the cold pool. At the same time, there would also be gust front spreading simply by the cold pool itself and that can also produce a lifting mechanism, but this lifting would be weaker than the lifting associated with the collision of the cold pool. And then lastly, we also need to have a weak subsidence effect. So just only based on three mechanisms put into this multi-column Lagrangian model, then we look at how the model may or may not be able to simulate larger mesoscale convective systems or self-aggregation. So here I'm showing you this multi-column Lagrangian parcel model with many, many columns. So randomly convection is generated at time zero. And then after 12 hours, we find that the model is able to produce aggregated behavior of larger self-organized convection separated from another cluster over here. And this is actually very similar to a simulation produced by a 2D cloud resolving model, where we also drive the model using a very similar environmental condition. And this simulation also show that after some hours of the simulation, you can also get this self-aggregated behavior, meaning that convection is no longer randomly happening, but rather aggregated into a large system. So with this model, then we can also ask the question, which mechanism is more important for generating aggregation? So we tested uh, like whether it's the cold pool collision uh, mechanism or the gust front spreading mechanism or the subsidence effect. Definitely subsidence is very important without subsidence you cannot really simulate convective self-aggregation but we also find that um, the cold pool collision is also a very important mechanism as without that one you can also not simulate the um, self-aggregation so now with this particular model we are beginning to really take a look at how under global warming when the environmental condition changes how um, convective aggregation may change. And I hope that we would be able to show you more results related to this in the future. So with that, I think my time is pretty much up and I would just like to summarize what I have been discussing. Uh, so MCSs are ubiquitous. They have many impacts on weather, climate. And so we have developed MCS tracking method to, to, to produce uh, a data set of MCS tracks over the US and also globally. So using this kind of tracking, we can perform model evaluation and better understand mechanisms or environment associated with MCSs. We find that models are quite skillful in simulating MCSs during springtime, but usually not during summertime, not even with convection permitting model. And Partly the reason is because during springtime, MCSs are supported by stronger synoptic system. So the model is able to simulate that. But in the summertime, MCSs are more associated with smaller scale, yeastward propagating atmospheric perturbations, and also perhaps uh, surface moistening coming from ev evaporation is also important. So we identify a positive feedback loop of MCS latent heating profile that generate mesoscale vortex that might amplify model biases if they are not able to simulate the heavy, top heavy heating profile to begin with. And then we also identify the importance of MCSs in dominating soil moisture precipitation feedback, which is again a positive feedback. If models not able to generate the MCS precipitation to begin with, you then cut off this positive feedback, which becomes important in producing summertime MCSs. And then lastly, we identified that in the last 35 years, MCSs have already been producing heavier 
precipitation and lasting longer, but projecting into the future remain challenging, especially not with global climate models that are not able to simulate MCSs. So that motivated us to re really look at the use of um, simple model to strip down to the bare bone and ask the question, what are the key mechanisms for the initiation of MCSs and how these mechanisms might be affected by global warming. So with that, I'm going to end my presentation here and see whether there are any questions for me. Yep. I'm going to uh, stop sharing. Great, thank you very much for the tour de force of mesoscale convective systems. Uh, it's actually fun to think about here in the doldrums of winter as we start getting into that uh, spring season of convection. Um, I have a couple questions. And so either put them in the chat or raise your hand. I see one hand raised from Juliet. So go ahead, and, uh, Juliet, and ask your question. Hi, Ruby. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation. Um, Thank you. Really um, impressive. And I'm particularly um, intrigued by your uh, tracking, mesoscale convective system um, tracking um, database. And I am curious if you have um, looked beyond just um, MCSs or like the utility of this um, product beyond MCSs. Um, so this product, uh was specifically developed to track MCSs. And so uh, I would have to say, first of all, the utility of that kind of data set would be that you can then combine that kind of data set with many other data sets to look, to really begin to probe what are the different types of characteristics related to MCSs, right? So for example, uh, last year we published a paper where we combine the MCS tracking data together with GPM latent heating. Then we can begin to ask question, what does the latent heating profile look like for MCSs over land versus over the ocean in the tropical region versus mid latitude region, et cetera. And we can also combine MCSs tracking data with reanalysis data to really look at like uh, how does MCS environment vary, let's say over the Amazon versus over the Sahel or other region. So I think this is the primary use of that kind of data set is really allow you to combine tracking with other types of data. Uh, but similar, similar kind of techniques have also been used by others in tracking tropical cyclones, tracking atmospheric rivers, et cetera. So I think this is really one important advances uh, in developing this type of algorithm is that you now have a tracking database that allows you to probe into large scale environments and many other um, questions that you might be asking related to the specific feature such as MCS or tropical cyclones or atmospheric rivers. Great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great, looks like we have a question from Larissa. Go ahead. Hi, um, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. So lots of interesting stuff that I wanted to delve into more. Um, I guess one, you, you had these parcel model results from the Romson Kwong paper or that methodology that were suggesting that um, increased drying in the boundary layer would lead to um, reductions in precipitation, but increases in uh, extreme precipitation. Mm -hmm. I was really interested in that. And I was wondering if that was like a general trend or just that, that you, were, you were thinking would be the case, or if that was just specific to like this, I think it was the central US you were looking at. Yeah, so uh, when we, uh, do the parcel um, modeling, right? So we have to provide the environmental profile to drive the model. So I would say that the specific results that I show are definitely results based on the environmental profiles over the central United States. Although I would imagine that similar results could probably also hold in other land region because based on what I've seen in uh, other types of studies looking at increase in the land aridity, it's, it's a very general trend uh, that under global warming, the, there was land drying simply because you, know, you have increase in the surface temperature, but the 
boundary layer humidity is not able to keep up with that um, increase in the temperature because there's just not enough evapotranspiration. Although in some regions where perhaps the moisture in the atmosphere is not so much relying on the surface evaporation, but more relying on the large scale moisture convergence. I think that could potentially be, be a different case. So I, I think it's important to also look into these type of differences as well. So this could be a whole different mechanism. You pointed towards the humidity increases leading to extreme precipitation increases, but this could be a mechanism actually for boundary layer drying mm -hmm. really to lead to extreme precipitation increases. Right, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah, so, essentially with the boundary layer drying, what you see is really an increase in the convective inhibition. So the convective inhibition can only really keep the moisture around for so long, right? But if you do have, let's say, a dynamical mechanism, let's say you do, even in under global warming, there will still be uh, these eastward propagating mesoscale perturbation. And if you, if you do have a dynamical uplifting mechanism and you kept the moisture long enough because of the convective inhibition, it can still convect. And then you have these moisture to supply for the for the convection and, and therefore cause an increase in the extreme precipitation. Yeah. And the citation for that work was uh, maybe I'll email you about that later. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are a little past time. So uh, with that, uh, if there's not any any quick questions, I think we'll go ahead and thank you again. Um, lots of things. I have some questions too. I want to follow up at some point because especially yeah, feel, answer from feel free to feel free to really email me. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you for spending your day with us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.